fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KC. 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 1050 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is in the house. In the house? In the basement of the house of mystery? Yeah, practicing his karate. Yeah. <laughs> Jump-starting people's cars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy, what a, what a good man. Yeah, well, my wife's car, well, I was driving my wife's car, and, and her, it died. It's so cold. <laughs> Maybe you need to buy her a new car. I know. You're right. It's cheap, I'll tell you. I'm, yeah, I'm she, terrible. She should have a 2024 car. What are you doing? I know. You know, big Welcome. famous radio guy. <laughs> oh, you yeah. Can't, can't buy her a nice new car. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'm I'll give her any idea. I'm going to text her and say Oh, that. no. I want to say, well, what's going on here? <laughs> I know you will, too. How come you're driving that old... <laughs> piece of you know garbage there what's going on where's yeah, it's like 2017 well where do you spend your money oh my God. <laughs> cheeseburgers yeah <laughs> <laughs> cheeseburger yeah wimpy yeah. well anyway well so now we we are <laughs> going to be talking to a writer and he's from the other side of the world, even though the, the world's flat, so I don't know how that works. <laughs> right. He's That's right. So he's not really down under. He's 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 just lower right, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so now um, he, his newest book, Halifax Resurrection, and it's the Dr. Jane Halifax series, book two. So Roger Simpson, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Roger. Now this is a... It says it's based on, um, you know, a popular series down in Australia, the Halifax television series. Um, so did you did you write for that to begin with, or did how did, how does this all happen? Well, that uh, that series was, was happened about twenty years ago. Um, yes, yeah, so I created the series. It was about a forensic psychiatrist called Jane Halifax. And uh, we made 21 telly movies for Sunday night movies. Um, so it was quite successful back then. And uh, three years ago, uh, Channel 9 down in Australia decided to bring it back as a miniseries. And um, so we brought it back 20 years later, and it seemed to work as, uh, again. And so a publisher came along and said, have you thought about, about writing books? based on this character, and I said, well, no, I haven't. I've been too busy writing television. And uh, they said, well, give it some thought. And I said, oh, well, look, uh, I've never written a book before, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I expect them, expected them to order one. They ordered three. So uh, this book, we're talking about Resurrection, is the second of the three, and I'm well into the third as we speak, which will be due out later in the year. Well, that's interesting. I guess writing... It's a different procedure when you're writing for a series or a movie or it, as compared to a book, right? It's, it's, a, it's a different type of writing, so it has to be done differently. It's completely different. I, I have to admit I was a bit terrified uh, about writing prose um, because uh, I've been writing drama all my professional life, and the rules are quite different. Uh, in, in drama, it's portray it, don't say it. There's a, there's a rule against exposition where people go around explaining what's going on in their head. Well, that's the complete opposite of writing a novel, where um, the reader wants to know exactly what's going on inside the protagonist's head, even the antagonist's head. So it was quite a change in approach. And um, as I said, I was a bit terrified to begin with, but I'm kind of getting the hang of it. Uh, and I've had a lot of help from the publisher, of course, and some excellent editors, and uh, people have been holding my hand. So I got there in the end. I got there in the end. 
Well, yeah, if you got support, it helps because you're right. When you're writing something like in a book, people aren't watching it. They got to they got to picture it in their mind from what you write. So they've got to get a lot more description, I guess, a lot more, you know. Yeah. Yes, well, you think in drama, you're trying to write um, for the director at the end of the day. You're trying to write a director-proof script so that they get everything in and they interpret the performances the way you want them. So you, you, you're writing to that person usually, uh, whereas the book you're writing for the reader, it's, it's a much more pure form of communication. It's just the writer and the reader and no one else in between. And television, there's a hundred people with opinions along the way, mainly coming from the networks. Uh, and, uh, so it's a, it's a more cumbersome process. You get a lot more notes in television. Uh, in, in the wonderful world of publishing, they kind of say, uh, it's your book, Roger, go for it. And, uh, and then they come back with comments. But um, it's a very enjoyable process. And I think uh, at last I have proper contact with the audience and without all the intermediaries. You know, and then you get these actors that come in and they want to play the person differently. <laughs> they do. I mean, uh, yeah. they do. Uh, Rebe Rebecca Gibney, who plays Jane Halifax in Australia, I think it's, thinks she says, my character wouldn't do that. And I'm saying, well, whose character? <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, the writer likes to think it's their character, whereas the actor who um, gives birth to the character on the screen uh, is convinced it's their character, and the audience probably agrees with the actor. But um, I don't have that problem in the, in the writing in the book writing world. Um, not that it's a problem I haven't been able to cope with. The Rebecca and I are, are very good friends, um, although she's not at all like Jane Halifax. Um, she does that through acting. Uh, a lot of people ask me when I'm writing a Halifax story, do I visualise Rebecca Gibney in my mind? And my answer is always no. I know her too well, and she's very funny and naughty, and uh, that's not Jane Halifax. So it, it's a completely different process. And uh, when I write Jane Halifax, whether it's for a script or a book, I kind of see everything about her except her face. It's, it's not Rebecca Gibney's face. It's the sort of face of this person in my head that uh, is my Jane Halifax. Right. We've got Rebecca on the line. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the casting really didn't change how you uh, see this character and, and how you, uh, you know, kind of create her and breathe life into her in the book. Well, I, I think I learned a long time ago that casting can be a trap uh, when you're writing a script because sometimes you – let you, you, that the casting so powerful in your head that you let that actor uh, take the role over, and the danger is that you don't write the role properly, you don't flesh it out, you leave too much for the actor to fill in. And uh, I learned fairly early on in the process that that's not the way to write a successful script. A successful script has to exist, whoever is cast in the role, and it has to have all the ingredients in that role written into the script or, or the book. So it, it can be a trap, and you can get lazy if you sort of think, oh, Rebecca will know what to do. Uh, you, you've got to dramatise the moment, and you've got to um, put in her head or in her mouth, if it's dialogue for television, uh, the entire situation, dramatic situation surrounding the moment. Uh, that's the task of the dramatist or the, the author, and... Uh, as I said, casting can be a trap sometimes and you can get lazy and leave too much for them. So who is Jane Halifax? How would you describe that character yourself? Well, it was, it was interesting. Um, the Channel 9 back when we created the show uh, wanted a crime show and uh, I decided I wanted the female lead, which back in those days was quite unusual. And I wanted a detective who didn't carry a gun. So I looked around for options and came up with a forensic psychiatrist who sleuths her way psychologically through uh, the murder mystery. Um, so that's how she was created, a, a female lead who didn't have a gun but was in a situation of high danger, sleuthing her way to the answers um, with a diabolical criminal as her opponent. 
that's kind of the uh, story engine of the of Halifax. And what kind of relationship do you do you have with your characters? Someone like Jane Halifax, do you do you see her, hear her, feel her? Um, kind of how do how do you write that character? Well, I, I think with all characters, all leading characters, and and even with antagonists as well, there's an, always a little bit of yourself in the character. There's the uh, with your protagonist, there's the you imagine the, the heroic moments so that they probably come somewhere from deep inside your own self-conscious. And similarly with the antagonist, where you 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 you're playing out your fears and your and your imagination about um, people who have gone wrong, who have taken a wrong turning. So it's kind of, I think with all characters, you're kind of mining your own life experience or aspirations or fears or nightmares. <laughs> um, it really is a personal activity writing. And I think um, that's, well, I mean, Shakespeare discovered that a long time ago. It's, it's hard, hardly an original thought. But um, all, all big characters, whether they're protagonists or antagonists, are, are kind of an extension of the author. Heavily disguised, of course. <laughs> <laughs> does, does Jane ever surprise you when you write her? D does she take you places that you weren't expecting? I, I like it when she surprises me. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes you put her into situations and you're not quite sure how she'll react when she gets there. That's when she surprises you. You think she will, um, she usually has to talk her way out of a sticky moment uh, because, she, as I said, she doesn't have a gun. Um, so it's kind of, um, it can surprise you because uh, if the situation is threatening enough, uh, she's got to be very uh, creative to, to find a way out of, of the problem. So she can surprise you, and that, that's the uh, the magic of writing, I guess, is that when you you set up the situation, you plot the story, you you know where you're going before you start. Well, you think you do, but when you get into the actual scene or the actual chapter, that's when the surprising things can happen. When you put the ingredients together and uh, the sparks go off. Do you, do you know ahead of time, like when you're writing a series or a character like this, where there is a series involved? And like you said, you've got three books to do. Do you kind of know what you're going to do with the character over the three books ahead of time and kind of fill it in as you go, or do you just play it as it goes? Well, I I, I do. I'm a bit of a structuralist, and I do like to know where I'm going. And I was lucky enough to meet Bill Link many years ago, the creator of Columbo. And his advice was, uh, don't leave home without an ending, Roger. Uh, if you haven't got an ending, um, they're going to throw the book against the wall or um, throw a boot at the television set. Because with um, suspense, it's all about where you're taking the audience. Um, they're trying to figure out, as you are, uh, who, who the actual criminal is along the way and, and why they created it, why, why they um, did the crime. Uh, but it's got to be a pretty surprising ending or they'll be very disappointed because it's it's all about the ending and a lot of uh, murder mystery writers plot backwards they, they start with the ending to make sure it's going to be a satisfying end to that journey and they, then they plot backwards from that uh, beginnings are easy beginnings are comparatively easy because any dramatic situation with enough question marks around it is going to be intriguing but it's the ending that the audience will judge the entire production on. If it's a good enough ending, if it's a satisfying conclusion, if the piece of work has actually ended up saying something important about human nature or humanity. So I plot very carefully before I start. I, I, I ask myself two questions. Why am I writing the piece in the first place? And then the second question is, and where is it going to end up? And will that deliver the reason why I'm writing it in the first place? So those, those are my two big questions. Well, how do you keep track of uh, continuity in, in the uh, book series? Do you have a series Bible? I don't, I don't know if you have a series Bible for the TV show itself, but sometimes people use that. Sometimes they have another way of um, 
of, of keeping track of these things. Uh, do you have a, a certain process? Well, I have a couple of documents on the go. I, I have my narrative outline before I start, and then I have what I call it as, as a, a running storyline, which um, records what I actually do as opposed to what, to what I plan doing. And that becomes more and more important as the book proceeds. That you you know you keep track of what you've what you've um, written, because sometimes you you get you lose track of your original intentions along the way, and you've got to keep both documents going, or you can't remember which one you've done. You know you've done one of them, and you're not sure which. So there's a lot of tracking, especially with a highly detailed sort of murder mystery plot. Um, there's a lot of tracking that takes place. And so the original narrative document that you start off with gets progressively replaced by this running storyline, which is a sort of an up-to-date summary of where we're going. How do you handle um, writing a female character um, and getting the intricacies correct okay. with a female? Now, this is an interesting question because I get asked it a lot, especially at, at book launches when... Uh, uh, a, a lot of women sort of cross their arms and say, um, "Yeah, <laughs> you know, what makes you think you can write a female character uh, and get inside her head? And my answer is usually, well, if I was only restricted to male characters, it would be a pretty grey and ordinary world. So, you know, you can't restrict yourself to, you know, one gender or the other. And, and you... you, you if you're going to write drama about men and women, it's it's it's, it's going to be um, you're going to have to write both characters. Both you're going to have to write all genders. Uh, otherwise, you, I mean that's the world we live in, and and it's not that difficult to project yourself into the into the mind of your character, whatever their sex. It's it's well it is difficult on one level but it's not difficult on another level. It, it's difficult in that any new character is an unknown entity. Uh, it gets easier when the character becomes more and more established, and you're writing somebody that you think you know, and that you can uh, anticipate what they will do and think. But I don't think the agenda matters. I think um, good writing is um, well. Once again, I'll, I'll quote Shakespeare. I don't think. Um, I don't think his female characters are less than his male characters. It, it, now, so in, in your stories, it, it, is there a subtext or a meaning or something else lying underneath the entertainment? Yes. Um, I guess the, the subtext is kind of why you're writing the piece in the first place. It's, it, you're not just writing a story. That, behind the story, there's something you're trying to say. In, in the Halifax series, it's something about... Uh, Jane's search for humanity, even in the midst of the most appalling crimes. She's looking for the humanity that explains the crimes to the reader. Um, that she, can, she has to put a, a terrible serial killer into some kind of context to explain why they are the person they've become. Because unless she can do that, the, the character can't be understood. And life doesn't make any sense to Jane. She's looking for answers all the time. She's looking for the humanity behind even the most terrible crimes. So I think that's the big question behind any piece of writing, is that why are you writing the piece in the first place? Uh, what are you trying to say beyond the storyline? What are you trying to say about humanity? What are you trying to say about serial killers? Are you saying serial, Are you trying to say that serial killers are a product of the society in which we live? Um, is it, are they a product of their background? Are they a product of what? You know, that, that's the, the subtextual questions you ask yourself to kind of give yourself a map when you're writing, which is beyond just simple beginning, middle and end. It's kind of why you're writing in the first place. What, what do you want the book to say to the reader? Yeah. And so what is it you hope people get out of the books then when you write them? Just entertainment. I I I come back. Keep coming back to the word humanity with um, the Halifax books. I, of course, I want them to be entertaining. I, I want them to be a a puzzle that the reader's trying to solve alongside the writer. 
But I want Jane to find, especially in in a world of of darkness and crime, I want her to lead the reader to a human resolution. Um, and, and even with a terrible criminal to find some kind of peace and resolution in in the horror of it all. Um, does that sound a bit highfalutin? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's good. Yeah, no, it's 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 understandable. Yeah. So now, now the violence and the action. How do you keep it going, and and how do you write your violence? Is it? it did you are you careful? Are you thinking about how are you going to write it? Well, I'm actually. This is a strange admission for me to make, but I'm a bit squeamish about violence, especially violence involving women. Um, most of my victims tend to be men. Uh, well, there you go. And I think um, they can take it. I, I think men can take it. But um, I, I get very squeamish when there's um, when the victim is female. And I think that female victims can often be an easy option. Um, but I think they suffer enough in, in the world and they don't need my books to make their lives any more appalling. <laughs> so I, I, I can't think of many female victims I've had, which may make my books and TV shows predictable. I don't know. I haven't really asked, asked myself that question before. I hope it doesn't. Um, I may tempt the viewer to think that there that there's a, a female victim along the way, um, but generally speaking, I, I'm squeamish when it comes to female violence, violence against females. Mm. So now, evil characters, the bad people, the bad people in your books. Do you like writing them? Yeah, I, I do like writing them because um, I think the. They're just like the protagonist is an extension of the writer. The antagonist is too, and um, that, that you're writing your nightmares or your fears or your disappointment about humankind, um, and you also want your antagonist to be a formidable opponent for your lead character, Jane Halifax. You don't want her up against somebody who's going to be a pushover. You, you want to to have a, a formidable opponent for her. And, and and that's Shakespearean too. I know that's the third time I've quoted Shakespeare. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the bigger and more complex the villain, the more interesting the story, because it's a reflection too of um, humankind. It's not just the, we're not all heroic. We, we, we disappoint ourselves as well. So it's all an ex extension of the writer, their fears, their aspirations, their nightmares, and their few and far between triumphs. Well, you know, now y your character, so Jane Halifax is a forensic psychiatrist. Yes. Um, so how do you how do you tackle writing that to make it sound uh, believable? Do you do a lot of research in that field, or do you have some sources? Yes, I, I, I have advisors. Um, uh, in the television shows, I had a professor of forensic psychiatry at Melbourne University who was my advisor uh, for many years. And um, so I rely heavily on that sort of thing. In this book that I've just written, uh, Resurrection, which is about um, Jane Halifax, um, she has a, loses her memory after a, a terrible car accident. Uh, I, I consulted with a um, neurosurgeon on that to make sure I got her recovery correct. So I do rely heavily on experts in whatever field I need, whether it's the law or, or a police expert or a medical expert. Um, I write the story and then I um, present the story to the expert and they help me through and say things like, well, I don't think she'd say that, Roger, but she might say this. So I research it before I start, but most of the good research comes in after the first draft when the expert sort of scratches their chin and, and, and often comes up with a, you know, a better way of, of putting it. So I do rely heavily on research because uh, I think the audiences are pretty smart these days and they demand authenticity in these, 
in, in these stories. The, the police work has to be authentic. The, the courtroom scenes have to be authentic, and the medical background totally authentic as well. Yeah, or you'll you'll hear about it on the internet. <laughs> No? <laughs> you'll hear about it. Or you'll, you'll get emails if you do something wrong. Yes, you do. Oh, you, you do. That's all. It, that, that, that's what most people write about, the, the mistakes. So you don't like making them at all. But uh, people love to point them out. Yes, I have lots of experts um, that I surround myself with, which, which slows the process down a little bit, but it enriches it as well and... They come back with um, good suggestions too, so it's a, it's an enjoyable process. It's better for the story. So, do you, do you think about the reader when you write these stories? Are you or do you have them in mind as you write stories? I probably think about the reader more when I'm writing books than I did the viewer when I'm writing television. And I think it's because I I, I realise I have a personal relationship with the reader um, when I'm writing. A chapter. I know that someone is going to read that, and that it, that's me and them, and no one in between. In television, you, more often than not, you're trying to please the network, the people who are funding it, the people who have all their editorial input and their script readers and their heads of drama, and their buckets of notes that keep pouring in. You you get to the stage where they are worrying about the audience and you are worrying about them. Uh, what I like about writing books is that the publisher isn't that network person. The publisher is, is much more benign and helpful. And so you actually are free to think about the reader. And uh, when at the end of a day, when I finish my thousand words or whatever my target is for the day, I, I, I read back what I've written. Uh, I read it aloud uh, as I think the reader might read it and uh, I try to communicate with the reader that way but I'm much more conscious of the reader than I ever was of, of the television audience. Well that makes me wonder too how far outside of uh, the TV show the world that you've created for TV uh, how far can you go uh, or go outside of that with the book how much freedom do you have or do you do you feel somewhat restricted by uh, what's come before on the, the TV show and, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, when it returned? Well, it, there are very few restrictions in the book world, which is what I love, because uh, in television, the, the big restriction is budget. Uh, so you tend to repeat the same locations because that's more efficient. With the book, you can go anywhere you like. And uh, the third book, which I'm writing at the moment, is, is set in, in the States, in Silicon Valley, Wall Street, and Hollywood. You simply couldn't afford to do that in a television show. You'd have to decide on one location, one principal location. But with a book, you can go anywhere you like. As long as the story takes you there legitimately, and it doesn't feel strained, but it's a natural progression to follow that story, there's a huge freedom in, in book writing. There's no budget. <laughs> no budget for restrictions. <laughs> only your imagination is the only thing that limits it. Uh, limits the story. So now, are you doing social media? Do you have like a website? Uh, where where do readers find you? Well, they have to find me through the publishers' social media sites because I'm unfortunately not a social media person myself, much to my children's horror. But um, I'm just not in that world, and so I rely heavily on the, on the publishers, um, Simon and Schuster's social media in Australia and um, um, Blackstone's social media in America and Canada, uh, who are the publishers over there. So um, they ha have very active social media sites, and um, thank goodness for that because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the world today, it seems to be part of the marketing for almost everything. Absolutely. I think my publishers were a bit shocked that I didn't have a social media presence but uh, um i just i just don't have one i, I um probably see it as too time consuming <laughs> and taking me away from uh, uh my computer and my writing it was probably better for the mental health anyway it away. probably is <laughs> you know, so much stuff going on there and it is 
Well, it does take a lot of time. I've, I've noticed with my kids, they spend an awful lot of time on social media. I don't think I have that time. I think my time is taken up by writing and watching sport. Between the two things, that's my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I find that um, I like to get on first thing in the morning, five in the morning, spend maybe a half hour, hour, post the stuff for the shows and some extras, and then I try to walk away, you know. Yes. And it's kind of I'm trying to regulate it that way. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit more sane, but it's easy to get caught up in. It can be a lot of your time. And I don't know whether I'm that disciplined that I could limit it to a half an hour because I know when I'm reading newspapers in the morning that I'm, if I'm not careful, because I read them online, I read the New York Times, I read the Sydney Morning Herald, I read, you know, the BBC website. I've got to watch that um, if I'm not careful, you know, a couple of hours can drift by. And uh, I will rationalise it on the basis of research, but really I'm reading newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's probably a little better to read those papers than a lot of what people post online. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's probably more reliable and less confrontational. <laughs> that's completely, yeah. <laughs> you know, because people love doing that. So, yeah. so who who are your influences like? And that's a that's a cliche kind of question. But do you have influences in certain genres of writing or movies or TV? Is, is there certain things that you're fascinated with? Well, I sort of. Uh... I'm rereading at the moment the um, Elmore Leonard's Western short stories. I don't know if you're familiar with those. I, I knew him more as a, a crime writer in the later part of his career. But when he was a young copywriter and trying to break into writing, he wrote a lot of Western short stories, one of which was uh, uh, the Yuma story, which became a you know big uh, feature film later on. Is it 310 to Yuma? Is that the name? Uh, oh, yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was originally a, uh, a short story he wrote for one of those Western magazines. And a, a friend of mine, we were talking about Almore Leonard, and he said, uh, have you actually read us Western short stories? I said, no, I haven't. So he lent me a book of these Western short stories, and that's what I'm currently uh, uh, reading at the moment, sort of a, one each night before bed. They're very beautifully written, very simply written. Uh, they've got, like a lot of good short stories, they've got, they're a high concept um, idea told very efficiently and, and you know, with, with, with no deviation from the central plot. So short stories are a pretty... Short stories are important for, in, in, the, in the film and television world. I mean, Brokeback Mountain was a short story. So I like the high concept of a short story. Uh, I'm particularly enjoying Elmore Leonard's Western short stories at the moment. And uh, he, he's been a big influence in my crime writing. Oh, that's interesting. That's, a, that's an interesting take. So what are you going to be when you grow up? It's, it says here in your thing that you've daydreamed through... High school, college, one marriage, and all this, you know, and you're wondering and you keep falling back to sleep and stuff. So now now that you're old enough, so what are you going to do when you grow up? Um, I, 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 I'm, people, my friends keep waiting for me to retire, but I, I can't play golf. So I, I've never met anyone who's retired who doesn't play golf, any, any successful retired person who doesn't play golf. So I'm kind of stuck with writing. And... Uh, um, I've got a friend that calls me a, a, not a workaholic, but a writerholic. I've got to do my thousand words a day or I feel uh, dissatisfied, incomplete, um, like something's missing. So I think I'll, even when I grow up, I'll still be a writer. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I do. Yeah. Well, do you just sit down then? Do you force yourself to write like every day? You've got to sit down and do you have a time set up or... And and even if it doesn't come out very good, you just you do it every day. Uh, I I do it every day. It, it's hard to start, which is probably why I waste so much time reading newspapers in the morning. But you know, this is a form of procrastination because. But it's hard to start. But once you start, once you actually get those that first paragraph down, and the first few sentences that have us, you know, the right kind of rhythm and music, um, you're kind of off and running. It's only the start that's difficult. 
and that's you sort of have to force yourself and usually it's um, because the clock is telling you it's pretty late to be starting the day, Roger. You better get on with it. <laughs> it's getting dark already. And you yes. Started. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go through that all the time. I'll yeah. tell you. Yeah. Well, that's, it's fascinating. Great. And good. It's really good to talk to you. It's been great talking to you guys. Mm. Yeah. And, okay. And so the book, Halifax Resurrection. And it's the Dr. Jane Halifax series, book two. Now, we'll have the books and everything up on the website so people can find it. And our guest is the author of that, Roger Simpson. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you both. It's been fun. Thanks, Roger. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www houseofmystery.com Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.